So this is the second day of our webinar. We uh, give fully this time to Nori. This Nori, you may start. Thank you. Thanks very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Ria Stuti uh, said, it's morning here. So um, and a very nice morning compared with yesterday. Today we'll be talking mainly or starting off with course measurement and the importance of courses. And what I'm showing you now is probably the latest of the um, Jones. Of the Jones counters. They're not they're not all called Jones counters. This one is made. Um, sorry, this one has uh, made in, in UK. It's very substantial and it's been machined. So I found this worked very well. You can see the counter on there, I think. That's interesting. It sort of disappears with the background. Um, and that, as you can see, is only a five digit uh, counter. So a um, bit unfortunate in that regard, uh, which we'll talk about just now, but it's very substantial. And I must share with you that in a previous uh, measurement I did in Africa, I got caught in a flood, literally in a flood where the water came up over the center of the wheel and this was totally submerged. And uh, those that are course measurers, and I think there's about 12 of us on here, um, this carried on, worked perfectly. I had to get a lot of QD40 into it, but um, yeah, a very, a very good investment. If you can get hold of one of these uh, UK ones, then uh, do so. It's much more uh, substantial than the other ones that we've been dealing with. Okay, I'm going to go back and uh, share the screen again, hopefully. And we can start on the course measurement side here. And I believe that the course measurement is probably the very first thing that most um, races should look at doing because the course is actually the critical uh, part of any logistic organization. So what are the requirements? Rule 55 of World Athletics requires the course to be run on tar road or hard road between curbs or defined area of the road. What does that mean? It means that uh, if you have a two-way uh, or a four-way carriageway or a dual carriageway, depending how you look at them, um, if you were only running in one lane, then obviously you would have fencing or some barrier to separate the runners from the cars, and you would only measure within that area of the one lane width. It's measured on the shortest possible running line. And this is basically straight from, um, straight from the track rule. So where there is a curb, it is 300 millimeters from the curb. Uh, that's roughly, what, uh, 12, 12 inches, roughly. Um, and if it's a white line or the edge of a tar, tar or something like that, that uh, there is no obstruction to the ankle, then you would be using 200 millimeters from that edge or line. It's measured by the bicycle counter method, which we will go over. Um, and you've just seen one of them, and there's the photograph of it on the, the left there. And uh, it is fitted to the wheel of a bike. Um, in this particular case, it's designed for a right hand, but you can get them for left hand wheels. And the reason it's better to put it on the, the right hand is that on mountain bikes, which you see here, this is a mountain bike that's been used with its tread. 
um, there is a disc brake and more and more some road bikes are putting disc brakes on here, which stops uh, this. I don't know if we can see it again. There is a peg on here that fits between the, uh, the spokes. Maybe I'll come back to that, the peg there that fits between the spokes and the spokes drive this around. Um, you can't get the peg into the spokes where there is a disc, um, a disc brake on it, or not easily anyway. Um, some of the older ones I've had to modify to get on to, to that. Also, some of the road bikes we're getting have a, a bigger hub on them. And so again, there is a, a problem uh, getting this to fit above the hub size. Um, it's measured by the bicycle counter method that's explained in the rules and for recognition at uh, international levels or AIMS membership. Um, we use only World Athletics or AIMS A or B grade measurers. Now there is something called a C grade measure and a C grade measure and this may help my friend from uh, Malaysia uh, Ahmed, I think, who asked a question offline yesterday. Uh, there is a C-grade measurer. A C-grade measurer is anyone who has attended one of the official um, World Athletics AIMS courses, um, but has not been graded A or B. And measurement is, is one of the very peculiar uh, technical official qualifications because it is highly practical. Um, by that, I mean, it, it's not really about answering questions in the exam paper. You don't, you have to know the rules, but more important is your ability to do measurement. And measurement is something that requires good cycling standard. Um, <laughs> I will say a bit of nerves and guts because uh, you find yourself cycling in the middle of traffic often because race organizers perhaps don't have uh, police backup or whatever to assist you during the measurement. Uh, you may also find yourself cycling into traffic. Um, so you've got to have a fairly steady nerve and you've got to be able to take control of, of the cars and traffic and so on around you. Um, and then you've got to be able to do basic maths, a um, bit of geometry and algebra, um, and even a bit of trigonometry. So, but it's not highly complicated, but you've got to be able to think it through on that. And then you've got to be able to write a report and submit a report that uh, shows exactly what you did and exactly where the running can be and so on. So from that point of view, uh, they've, they normally will put you through a course and then they will expect six, seven uh, reports from you of local races that you've measured and there will be some form of assessment of your accuracy of doing that. And so often it takes two, three years for a person to be moved from a national measure to a B grade. And then again, another two, three years of consistent measuring to get to an A grade um, measure. And basically an A grade or a B grade can fly into a country uh, at the request of an organizer or an association and really be given basic information and asked to measure a route and adjust the route to the correct distance or A grades often are asked to validate records of some nature, in which case You've already booked your days. You've estimated how long it will take. You fly in and you hope you don't have a puncture. You hope there are no problems. You hope everything is uh, already arranged. Uh, they're waiting for you. 
that there's a correct sort of bike, correct size of bike, and you get on and you know that you've got to have it finished by a certain time so that you can get back to an airport and fly out. So that is why they are so specific on, um, on the qualifications of a, of a measure. A bit like photo finish. You've got to know what you're doing. You can find yourself in a, a track timing photo finish situation, and you've got to be able to make it work, even although it may be different from what you're used to, um, or the system is different, you've got to be able to get in there, set things up and make it work. It's a much more practical than say being uh, a chief judge in a, in a discus, uh, you know, or uh, a referee uh, for the field where your ability to know the rules and to apply intent of the rules is really the prime primary objective. Anyway, um, that's on qualification and hopefully, um, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting, I think it is Mr. Ahmed um, from Malaysia, or from Maldives. Um, if you want to follow up today on that discussion we had, let's try and find out um, what status your various measurers are. Uh, the certificate has of measurement for a course has a five year validity if it's unchanged. In other words, uh, no one has come along and moved the curbs or uh, had roadworks in there that adjust the curbs, particularly at the corners, um, or you haven't changed the road. You can't just have a route measured and then decide that you're going to move the start or move the finish without it really being validated again. Um, you know, there, so if it's not been uh, changed at all, then your investment in having it done uh, is spread really over the five year period. What's interesting in this photograph is there is the counter this time on the left hand side, a digital counter with the peg through the spokes. And um, as I say, it can go on this side. Now, later on, I'm going to show you a photograph where the GPS is directly above on the handlebars. So the idea here is that as that wheel goes around, you're measuring the distance of the circumference of the tire on the road. But we'll come to that in the video. Uh, the, basic, the basic setup is we mark out a 300 meter straight, as flat as possible calibration distance using a standardized steel tape. Now, standardized steel tapes are what, uh, as an engineer and as a surveyor, um, we used to use. Um, nowadays, they're actually quite hard to get hold of. But So you have to buy a standardized steel tape, which is by standardized, it means that it's been uh, SABS or, uh, you know, it's been measured and, and marked to a international standard so that you know that it's correct. And a lot of the steel tapes that you will buy in uh, building warehouses and so on are not standardized. And what you will also find normally in the first meter somewhere on the front or the back in red is um, 20 newtons at 20 degrees centigrade written on it. That tells you what it was standardized at. In other words, there was a force of 20 newtons applied to the tape at 20 degrees centigrade, and at that, it is accurate. So that's where how you can tell uh, that the tape has been standardized and is suitable for marking out your 300 meter straight line. I'm not going to go into real detail on that, otherwise we'd be doing a course measurement course, but trying to keep the principles. 
So normally they will need two, possibly three people to do that so that you have someone lining you in to keep straight the whole time. I have marked out a standardized 300 meter by myself um, using nails, a hammer and um, a straight line. So if I've got a straight yellow line and I move that tape, my taped line um, 100 millimeters off to one side, and I nail and I've got the tape and I can nail it so that um, each 300, uh, each 50 meters or whatever is on the line. I can pull it, nail in the next one, go back, line it up again for the next one and I can manage to do it myself. But ideally you want three people doing that and you're looking for a piece of road that is 300 meters long, that is as straight as possible and as uh, flat as possible. I've often been asked, why don't we use an electronic distance measurement machine to measure that 300 meters? And the answer is very simple. Uh, any electronic distance measured or theodolite type distance measured is done in the air, whereas the road actually moves like that. And we're using the tire on the road, not in the air. So we use the steel tape because we can make that tape uh, follow the contours of the road. Anyway, once you've got that and you've put your Jones counter on the bike, you ride that 300 meters four times and you check the difference in clicks between the start of the 300 and the finish of the 300 meters. Doing that four times and you average it gives you a fairly accurate idea of how many clicks of this counter there are for 300 meters. If you know the number of clicks for 300 meters, then you can work out how many clicks for a kilometer. And we add in, we multiply that number by a factor 1.001, which effectively means that you're putting an extra meter in per kilometer. So your 10 kilometer race, when it's officially measured, is actually 10 kilometers and 10 meters. And that gives a bit of safety for say a cone that's slightly out of place or gets knocked out of place or small errors uh, in the setup on the day or someone uh, takes a small uh, deviation or whatever, you know, small errors that happen in road races on the, uh, on the day, not major ones. Uh, there was a, a four kilometer four kilometer or four mile record in America, not that many years ago. Well, probably, <laughs> actually, if I think about it, it's probably a decade ago. Um, and uh, the, the record was supposedly uh, broken. So someone went in to validate that record and found that the course was short by something like a meter, a meter and a half. And uh, then they pulled the video and they found that outside the hotel, because it had been raining um, on that particular day, they put the cone to the left of a puddle. And when the runners came down, the runners actually had to run to the left of a puddle. And that made the difference and that allowed that record to stand because the cone had actually made the runners run one meter extra or one and a half meters extra. So that is a sort of level of um, accuracy. We'll talk more on that after this uh, video. Um, the, other, the, the other thing about the accuracy is that if two measurers measure a 10 kilometer race, um, then the difference between the measurements cannot be greater than eight meters. 
So if you have, one of you have measured that course and I'm coming along to validate that course, um, then we cannot be more than eight meters apart after every 10 kilometers. Um, normally we would uh, measure the course that's given to us by the course, by the uh, race organizer. Uh, you might put in intermediate points along the way, typically at 5Ks. Ideally, if you have the time and the traffic is um, controlled enough, then every kilometer. Um, and then you adjust the finish or the start or a turn point to get the correct distance. Um, it's amazing how many event organizers seem to think that cities were built especially for their races. Um, they want a, a 42 kilometer, a 21 kilometer, a 10 kilometer and a five kilometer and all must start and finish on the same line so they can save on gantries. <laughs> I can assure you when the Romans built some of the, uh, the cities in Europe and when uh, your race or your city was started um, like Lebanon way, way back in time, they did not think of running marathon distances. So the chances of you getting all four races to start and finish on the same line is incredibly hard, incredibly hard to do. And it is far better often to have a separate start, separate finish, particularly in COVID, by the way, a separate start, separate finish works much better than, uh, um, than trying to do lap courses. Um, and, and it doesn't have to be, you know, substantially far apart, but try and have them far apart because when the runner finishes, of course, they must go through now, collect what they get, and, uh, you know, whether that's one bag with a medal, water, some vouchers, and maybe even a T-shirt, unlikely, um, then they pick that up and they go. What you don't want is... Uh, the start group mixing with the finish group and so on. So, uh, adjust the starts, record the points and data will complete the measurement uh, report. Uh, I just collapse that a bit so I can see what else is down here. Uh, yeah, and the report then gets submitted to uh, a certifier and the certifier of course cannot check on site what happens is he goes through and he looks to see first of all does the report explain exactly what happened and what you did and secondly do the calculations make sense um, and thirdly could someone take that report go to site and be able to set up those start, finish, and turn points exactly as you have done them. So that's those are the three things the certifier tends to check. And then he will issue a certificate. And that certificate, um, and this is an unfortunate thing, but it has to be said, uh, measures should not issue that certificate in most cases uh, until all payments for travel expenses, et cetera, have been done. And that's an unfortunate thing that's going on in the world at present, but um, just something to keep in mind. Uh, as event organizers and as federations, the, the reverse of that is please support your measurement uh, people and make sure that any event that is being measured uh, fully compensates the measurement people within a reasonable time of finishing or prior to the event. It's now become a case where many measurement people are having to ask for um, partial payment up front. 
anyway, that's a, a, an issue that's unfortunately a, a statement on our moral standards in the world and doesn't apply everywhere, but something that we need to start being just a bit more aware of. I've said here, record points and details. That normally means driving a nail and a washer into uh, the ground at the particular point, and then measuring from that nail back to say a lamp post or a gate post or something that will not move. So that even if, um, you know, any paint marks are, are lost or burnt off in the sun, um, you can go back and you can measure and you will find that nail. Uh, so that you know that that is the official start point or finish point or five kilometer point. Okay, this is a video. It's, uh, it's quite an old video now, but it's of uh, Comrades Marathon, um, which is a 90 kilometer uphill, uh, alternating with downhill race in South Africa, uh, which I had to do a measurement for. It's a very big race in South Africa. Um, many of the countries that are on this have sent runners or have runners who have done comrades. Uh, you have 12 hours to complete it these days. And it is measured, although the distance is not a standard distance. I say it's 90 kilometers. It varies from about 86.2 to 91.5, I think 92 is probably about the longest we've ever had. But because it's so big, it gets TV coverage. And this was an insert that was done um, with a younger version of me um, on what course measurement is. And it's probably a nice overview. There's a section there where you will see I'm riding up the road um, towards a bridge and uh, you will see the police escort. Watch the minibus taxis and you'll get an idea of the danger of doing course measurement even with um, police escorts. And maybe just a, a last fun point as well. When you're driving nails in, I've said, put a washer underneath. If you don't have washers or you run out of washers, beer top, bottle beer tops make a very, very good washer. So it may mean that you have to do a bit of drinking to finish the measurement. But uh, anyway, let's watch the video. It's only a couple of minutes long. Oh. Let's go back and try again. It's over the years has vacillated at distance from 88 to 91 kilometers. So how do they get the exact measurement of the course? Let's find out with Laurie Williamson. And measuring any course, you go through a set procedure that's laid down by the International Amateur Athletic Federation, which is to start off by calibrating the Klein Jones, which is a digital counter you saw on the front wheel, uh, over a set distance. So we do that four times before, and you do that four times after the measurement of the course. And the reason is, it is so sensitive that even the weight of a person, and where he's sitting, or she is sitting on the bike, changes the number of clicks over that calibration distance. So when you calibrate, you can only use it for um, that one person. If someone else has to get on the bike, you have to recalibrate. The weather also plays a part in it, because when we start calibrating in the morning, it's often cold. And when you finish the course, then it's often much warmer. And so the tire pressure is increased. Therefore, the number of calibration clicks from the start to the finish of the calibration distance changes. So we're dealing with something that's very accurate. In fact, when we measured Sydney Marathon, the Olympic Marathon in Sydney, we found that the thickness and the different types of surface, road surface, actually made a very big difference. So you've got to look at all of these things. Once you've calibrated, you can then go and measure out the course. And then at the end, you do a post-calibration.
Climate has been measured for a number of years. This year, we've purposely gone through and measured it to the IWF standard using the claim germs. And we had a very good ride because although we started early and it took us probably about seven hours to, to do the measurement, we were lucky with the traffic and we had exceptional um, cooperation from the police, which allowed us to get the shortest line. Because the way these are measured internationally is on the shortest possible running line, which means cutting corners and so on. Now, it's very hard to do if you have a lot of traffic. So this year, we've got it very accurate. The way we've done the measurement this year is to pick up some of the points that were used in the past and add additional stable points. So all along the route now, we have a number of points. And because the route doesn't change that much um, year to year, we can pick up those points in future years for any alterations between two points. So hopefully, we will not have to do a full measurement again for a number of years. But of course, any time that there's any change in roadworks or the route has to change for traffic reasons or anything else, then we need to get uh, get another measurement done. And that route portfolio is held by Mervyn Williams, who's been one of the stalwarts behind Comrades for a number of years. And so he monitors where those routes are, where those changes are, and that's when another measurement would be required. So yeah, that gives an overview of it. And as uh, as was mentioned there in Atlanta, uh, in Sydney, uh, we had two calibration courses. One was at the stadium um, next uh, to the the entrance to the stadium, and the other one was down at the harbour, not far from uh, the Sydney Opera House. And uh, Hugh Jones, who is a certifier in UK and a course measurer, obviously also the uh, the same person who won the London Marathon 209 marathon runner in 1982. Uh, he was the chief measurer there. And um, <clears throat> he and I were, were staying there for, for the week to do the measurement. There was a whole group of us that's, uh, that get together to, if you want to do professional points development, we pay, some of us pay for our own way to get there, to get the experience. And um, so we did the measurement and we found that there was a difference of 42 meters um, in our calculations and we couldn't work it out. And we went over the whole course again. And in the end, we found that because Hugh was using a a pneumatic tire and I was using a solid tire and because we had two different road surfaces um, that our difference was excessive and it took us probably three four days to find that difference but that is the accuracy with which the measurement of a course is done. Uh, Having a look at this, this is actually in Palestine, in Bethlehem. Um, and I put the calibration here next to the center island because that was the safest place that I could get to that had 300 meters long uh, because, of course, people parked on this side of the road. So it was actually quite interesting to use the, the center lane and of course, you've got to be able to cycle in both directions. So two of those calibrations are going to be against uh, the traffic. Uh, this is just a nice photo to show you where the runners would run. Obviously, they've come off from where the camera is. They would come down and run on that corner, back across the road and hit that area there, which is the next corner. So it's the shortest line that you're using. Uh, some of you may well recognize this. This is outside the palace area in Bangkok. Um, and you'll find that there is a calibration route there. Um, again, the, the challenges there are things like the security police and so on. But I mean, that uh, I think is the amazing Thailand uh, marathon. 
And it is certainly an amazing experience uh, around there. That uh, route has a 21 and a 42 uh, uh, event down there. I think one of the biggest events in Bangkok, but you guys will know about that far better than I do. Uh, so in planning for your measurement, have the route approved in principle by the authorities and get an idea of what changes can be made. Um, in the Thailand one, for instance, we had a turn point on a freeway, an elevated freeway. Um, and so it's relatively easy just to extend that to get the correct uh, distance. Uh, have a trial measurement, get one of your local cyclists or whatever to put a GPS on and just cycle the route and see what it works out as. And uh, that will give you a rough idea. It cannot count as a measurement as we will see, but um, it gives you an idea. Then contact uh, the measurer, agree the costs, agree the dates, agree how they're getting in there. Typically, the measure is going to ask you for a well-maintained bicycle, uh, hammer, nails, and paint. These are the things that it's very hard to bring in from overseas. So well-maintained bicycle, what do I mean? Please do not go out and buy a supermarket special with plastic uh, brake grips and so on. Those, those aren't intended to do long distances. So rather borrow one um, from our local cycling uh, person or club or whatever, um, and then and borrow a reasonably good standard one. These measurers will have uh, measured many races, and so they know how to handle bikes. They're, you know, they're going to look after the bike. They understand the value of that bike. Uh, organized security or protection. What do I mean by that? Ideally, some motorcyclist um, who can pave the way ahead and show direction ahead. Um, but any vehicle, any four by four uh, vehicle that can drive behind the, the measurer is normally fairly good protection. Uh, but if you can get police, that's the first prize. And that's not always possible, but uh, that's the uh, first prize. So look at the, what security makes sense for the, site, uh, for the measurer. A measurer will tend to uh, measure with traffic, but where it's a, a road like this one here, um, you're going to go against traffic. You're not going to measure parts and then you're going to cycle across and you're going to end up going against traffic. And if that road turns to the right ahead, then I'm going to go right across to, uh, to measure the traffic, to measure the line on the shortest line. So the sort of protection required is dictated by the sort of route that you're, you're measuring. Uh, in Atlanta, um, when we measured that 1996 for the Olympic marathon, uh, we had a mass of police motorbikes and so on, but we were going right through the city center, uh, down the Cherry Blossom route, and uh, I think we had 15, 15 measurers in that group, one after another, and we were really well protected and well looked after. In Athens in 2004, the route hadn't even been completed. Um, they were retarding part of the route just after the start. And luckily, they had put the curbs in already. And so we were able to measure on a corner on top of the curb, which gave us a, a slightly shorter distance um, a tighter distance than we would normally measure, but we couldn't put the, the bike tires onto the tar because the tar was still hot. So yeah, we, you've, you've got to be fairly innovative and 
uh, so on. So security is a very important thing. In Satara in India, uh, I've had to measure round around about and directly into traffic. Somewhere I've got a photo of that, maybe in the slides, we'll see. Um, and, and you just stop and start to get your way through. And as long as someone is there sort of explaining why and what you're trying to achieve, the majority of car drivers are very um, helpful. Then you need someone there that can make decisions on your route, someone from the organization who can say, okay, I don't want you to move the finish, uh, let's adjust at the start. Or yes, we can go to the right of this roundabout, we don't go around it in the normal fashion. Someone who will take responsibility for making those decisions, because whatever decision is taken by that person and by, and by the um, race organizer, whoever has made that decision, it has to work. Yeah. Um, identify the calibration in straight flat so that you've got some idea for when the measurer arrives. Generally, the measurer is the best person to determine how to do a route because they've got that experience, they've seen it, um, and there are risks. And therefore, it's the measurer that stands to lose out. There are real risks of being on a bike, measuring and holding a fixed line in moving traffic. Try to let the measurer make the decision as to how that route is going to be measured. The accuracy, okay, so I'm sure any race organizers, uh, and you'll hear it on social media afterwards, um, Mr. Organizer, your race is long, my GPS says, and if I had done a sub four hour marathon, I would have been uh, qualified for this or that or the next thing. Um, the answer is, no, I, I'm not interested in your GPS, it is inaccurate. So this picture here was a four kilometer course that I measured in, um, in Dubai around a park on cycling track, which was used for a race. Uh, there's the location of the four kilometer mark, which is 4.003 um, kilometers without the safety factor. Here is the GPS directly above the counter. And you can see that it's telling you that it overreads by 4.5 meters per kilometer. Typically worldwide, a GPS on a person's hand or wrist is eight meters per kilometer minimum overread. So if you're trying to run a 10 kilometer race or distance, by your GPS, you want it to read 10.08 kilometers on your wrist for you to be sure that you have run at least 10 kilometers. So there is an inaccuracy in that. Here is the Athens Marathon as run. And there you can see the track, I've blown it up. And you can see that as we come down here, the stadium, by the way, is down here for the finish. So this is in the center of town. These are very wide roads, very clear. Um, and you can see here that it looks as though I've gone through the front, the front lounge or the gardens of the houses along here. This is the way the GPS has tracked it. This is the full route from Marathon going through into Athens, which appears to be on the, on the road. But in fact, when you blow it up, you can see and zoom in, you can see it's going through the front lounges. 
in Athens. Okay, weather changes it, rider weight changes uh, uh, the accuracy of a measurement, a road surface, I've covered all of that. Uh, and there's your GPS accuracy, eight meters per kilometer minimum. If anyone brings your GPS that is reading less than race distance, you can be very confident your course is short. Okay. Route configurations. Route configurations are incredibly important um, in, uh, in COVID times. Uh, but A to B routes allows for a serial of races. Here's an example um, where the finish is in uh, Tata uh, on the track at the university. This is in Eastern Cape in South Africa. Uh, the start is uh, 42 kilometers away on a freeway. Uh, they run in the yellow safety line um, all the way up. Kunu, by the way, is the home of Nelson Mandela, or was the home, and it's now his burial place, obviously. And this race is a celebration of Mandela and the surroundings. And so there is the 21 kilometer start up here, the 42 down here, the 10 kilometer and the five kilometer. And obviously these starts can all happen at the one time, um, more or less because the last finisher of the 21 is in before the first of the 42, just getting the timings right. So yeah, that's, that's a nice, system particularly now for COVID because um, you're not cluttering the road with numbers of people and if you're starting with uh, staggered groups then you can keep the finishing rate at the track down to a minimum number of people so you're keeping your social distancing etc. The runners are always facing traffic and uh, that helps. It's by no means ideal. Ideally, we should have um, all roads closed to traffic and barriers between them, but in various parts of the world, that just becomes impossible. Um, lap courses, if you, even if you do a 42 kilometer as a two lap course, your front runners will catch your back runners um, probably about 30, uh, probably about 13 k's in so that would be about 30 kilometers uh, 25 30 kilometers depending on what your cutoff time is for your back markers um, obviously it increases the risks of cheating has those, by the way, any out and back course, you any course that has to go out and back, you need to have some sort of monitoring at the turn points to prove they've gone the, the full distance. Uh, a lap course, on the other hand, reduces the amount of resources because you're using your water point twice, uh, you're using your manpower twice, so that helps. It reduces the traffic impact and the amount of police and alternative routes that you need to find for, uh, for uh, local residents, for those that don't want to be involved. An A to B course, on the other hand, of course, uses a mass of uh, transport. It uses a mass of police. It uses a mass of, of um, manpower to marshal the route. But as the route progresses, you're able to open up the, the traffic and get people back to normal. You can also, if you don't have all of these races uh, and you only had a marathon going from A to B, uh, you can allow traffic to be running here until the marathon gets closer. Um, and as the back markers move up, you can open up the end here. So root configurations are actually 
quite important to consider. Dual carriageways also allow for faster wave starts by doing a left side, right side and bringing them across. On the other hand, a dual carriageway on an A to B system can also uh, provide the safety by turning the one side of the dual carriageway into runners only and the other side into cars going in both directions. So it really is about the culture of driving in your city and in your country. It is about what is available and what is what are the alternatives available to um, people who don't want to be involved in, in the race? Residents who just want to get on with their normal life. And these are all considerations. Now, when you're dealing with a big city like New York or London or whatever, the event is so big and so massive to the country that the police and the authorities are willing to close those roads down totally and inconvenience the residents uh, for the benefits that it brings to the city. Last night, there was an announcement um, that Cape Town Marathon uh, in Cape Town down here, the Sandlam Cape Town is now one of two candidate cities uh, for becoming uh, one of the major events, major Abbott major world marathons. As you will know, there are six of those around the world at present. Uh, Singapore, I believe, have just withdrawn from the, the bid to, uh, to be a marathon major. But the six, they're going to add in some more marathon majors and Cape Town is a candidate city, which means one of the very first things for any label event is total road closure for you to have that label event. So, yeah, there will be large numbers coming hopefully to Cape Town over the next three years where they will be assessed as a candidate event to join the majors. The route configurations become absolutely critical. Uh, this is a local race and uh, it's more in a lap using residential uh, races, but it has been, uh, has been uh, amended to try and work for uh, COVID here. So um, start to finish, and finish to start. So they were looking at how, and this is just a bit of innovation, how they take a, a race and they've um, started it at the finish and started it at the start and run them in two different directions. And they get to this point here where uh, one set go this way on this route and the other set are going this way on the original route. And so by getting the timing right, you don't uh, ever have the people meeting or facing each other. So they've, each race has its uh, separate route over the critical midpoint. So, yeah, uh, relays, there's no reason why you shouldn't design a race as a relay. So you have multiple venues, you know, we're going to have limited numbers. So for instance, there's a race down here that we're, we've designed, hasn't been run as yet, using three wine farms as, uh, as venues. It's a 10 kilometer and literally, that means you have three start points, almost like a, a baseball option, I'm calling it, where uh, there are two or three separate starts and they move round. And when you've completed the lap, you will have done uh, the 10K, but there is no clash between the, the, the people. Um, looking now at 
What about records? If you're going to have records, then you've got to meet certain standards under World Athletics and AIMS. Um, systems to start and finish cannot be more than 50% of the distance as the crow flies. So for instance, uh, uh, Boston has a problem as a world record because it's an A to B course going from uh, the start out at Hopkinson right down to the finish in central Boston. Um, so the start and finish is greater than 50% of the distance. And so it cannot, it cannot be used for a world record. You may remember that the fastest time was uh, run in Boston 203 long before that record was actually uh, allowed. The other side is you cannot have greater than one meter per kilometer drop. So if you have a 10 kilometer race, the altitude of your start cannot be more than 10 meters above the altitude of your finish. Cannot be a downhill course. So things to keep in mind on, on that. Olympic and world qualifiers, the separation can, so for instance, Boston can be um, a, a, a world or Olympic qualifier, uh, but even although the start and finish are over 50% apart, over 21 kilometers apart, as the crow flies, um, but the drop should be under one meter per kilometer. And for a world ranking, the drop may be more than one, per, uh, one meter per kilometer, but the ranking points will be adjusted. So you will know that uh, we have gold, silver, bronze, platinum uh, level runners. Uh, or athletes around the world and they are scored on performance time performance but the points that they get for that are adjusted if it's done if their performance is on a downhill course or an assisted course as it is known other routes uh, considerations and configurations here is the uh, the field at about 24 k's in Comrades, which attracts 16,000 runners on the day. It's done on a normal two lane road. And there is what you're looking at in terms of runners per minute at about 23 k's. Um, and this is on the up run, same sort of distance. 16,000 starters, clearly as it stands or has been run, it wouldn't work for COVID uh, assessment at the present moment. Um, runners per minute and area assessment is the way you can do this. So by staggering starts and various other techniques, you can get this down. A true 1.5 meter spacing requires seven meters squared per runner. I mean, that's just taking the, the area of a circle. So staggering improves that, uh, that space allowance. Um, yeah, staggering improves that space allowance and minimize the early corners after you really want a straight line after the start for your runners to spread out. But in the majority of places, um, once the gun has gone, you're, you're going to be okay. Because once you've worked out your staggers to get the start socially distanced, anything that happens after that only gets better. So uh, identify possible points for medical exit uh, and evacuation, refreshments and restocking. Um, 
your toilet, restocking the refreshment tables. Where are you going to put your toilets? Are you going to have spectators? You know, we're talking nowadays about no spectators along the route. Well, that's never going to happen because people will naturally come out. I mean, if you look at the Olympics in Tokyo, we saw that people came out along the route and spectated. What you can do is identify areas and then say, okay, you can only have so many uh, people in that area and you have some sort of security person on there just making sure that uh, there are no more than the, the required number in that area. Uh, medical, nowadays we're looking at how do you, from the time of collapse, you have ideally three minutes and hopefully never more than 10 minutes in which to get to that person. Now, obviously, that has not been looked at here because there is no way you will get an ambulance or even a motorbike through there in three minutes. And that is something that is now more the international standard and desired level is plan to get a medical person there uh, within three minutes and not more than 10 minutes. And what sort of emergency are we talking about? We're talking about a collapse someone that has had a heart attack or of that nature. And in which case you're trying to get someone there to resuscitate them. And the, the obvious use is uh, automatic electronic defibrillator, AED, as it's known, which happens also to be the currency, of course, in UAE. So don't confuse the two. But What's happened in China is particularly successful in that is to have along the route people who observe the runners and whenever they see someone collapsed or whatever the cell phone or WhatsApp or uh, make contact with a set communication structure, uh, they will have people on motorbikes or electronic scooters along the way, typically two people um, and one AED. And I mean, I know there's a race, Kunming in China, and they have 168 AEDs out there on race day. I mean, that is just phenomenal. And yet I'll go to Lusaka in Zambia and the whole country does not have even one AED in a hospital. So resuscitation in that, uh, or one mobile AED, resuscitation in Africa, in Lusaka, and in Zambia is totally different from the situation in China. These are variations that we have to start working with. But we want to get someone there within three minutes. And every minute after three minutes uh, that this person is, uh, his heart is not beating, brings a deterioration to the point that it is questionable whether what you've resuscitated after 10 minutes is a reasonable uh, life you know, reasonable standard of life. So it's very important that we start looking at, at that. Uh, exit and ev evacuation. Refreshment tables uh, in COVID, as you know, we're, we're saying that no one should be handing bottles. It should be self-service off there, which means that you need to do a couple of things. Um, one, you need to look at how many tables you've got, allowing for the fact that 50% of those tables could be out of commission while you're restocking them. So you have blue tables, red tables, green tables, and you're rotating the use of those tables 
while you're restocking the ones that have just been used. So that's one aspect to really put consideration into. Uh, also, you know, it, it's a very hot day. Chicago Marathon, for instance, was stopped once because uh, the weather was, uh, it was far too hot a day. Um, I remember in 2005, a London Marathon had a very hot day. I was running, helping someone through to their very first marathon. And by 15 kilometers, they had run out of water on the tables. And yet they had tables every mile with 500 uh, milliliter bottles. So every one and a half Ks, they had tables. Um, and they'd run out of water. And we were probably halfway through the, the pack at 15 Ks. So positioning of your refreshment tables is very important. Um, and making sure that you can get a truck in with extra water if that is required. And of course, that means that the truck has to be on a communication system and someone in the jock or in the logistics center has to be monitoring it. And again, if we go back to the idea of sectors, you can have some sort of safety emergency system within that sector to handle it while you perhaps bring in a greater supply from outside. Um, of course, predicting how many bottles people will take is also important. And how much water you put on that table is also important. For me, a 500 milliliter bottle is far too much to have on any refreshment table. Um, and the rough guide as to what a runner needs in normal conditions is about 600 milliliter per hour. But we'll, we can talk about that later under refreshment tables. So all of these are important considerations. And parking is, of course, very important. Where are people going to park to get to the start of your race? So this all comes under route configuration. Consider how others can avoid the race. Um, you know, not everyone wants to be involved in the race. Think of routes around and how you can open. If part of a route or road is open, what safety measures are required for, for things like blind rises and uh, uh, acute corners? So give them these sort of things consideration. The final route choice um, is valid for five years. We've talked about that. Um, the route location may vary with uh, purpose. In other words, uh, the route we talked about early on, your choice of the route may actually be changed uh, depending whether it's performance or tourism. I know, for example, the Tokyo Olympic route uh, was changed uh, even the one in uh, Osaka was uh, changed because they wanted it to go past uh, the tower and made sure that uh, they could show off the city. There's a typical old certificate. The new certificate is uh, uh, slightly more simplified than that. Uh, this shows you the barrier and route layout and how we've worked out where the water tables were, et cetera, for the muscat. Configurations are guided by numbers, other race distances, minimizing traffic disruption, reduce risk. That's the very first thing that needs to be considered. And then look at what uh, police marshalling, residential uh, objections, medical, and of course now viral ass uh, assessment. Um, and look at what are their maximum numbers that you can do and minimizing the logistics, but also have a vision for five years down the line. Will that route still be valid in five years with the sort of growths you're expecting? Okay, that's a, sort of a, a, a nice breaking point. 
do we want to have just a, a short break and uh, also a, a discussion? Are there any questions that we want to look at? Yeah, there are, there are two questions actually. Okay. Box. Let me just bring my volume up again. I had to put it down for the video. Yes. Okay, the first question is from Mr. Falsam. Uh, point to point risks are more likely to exceed the IWF rule 260.28 on the straight line on the separation of the start and finish. 50% of the resistance and allowable evaluate, sorry, sorry, and allowable eva, elevation change one kilometer, one meter per kilometer. Can you explain this clearly? If such is not observed, the performance cannot be considered for record. Just yeah, okay. So, an A to B race, such as the one that I showed in that photo, uh, in that map, maybe we can go back to it. Let me just see if I can move this to go back to it. Um, this one. Um, that race, is basically about 38 kilometers between the start and the finish. And so it cannot be used for a record. And the reason is that a wind could be a tailwind blowing the runners all the way to the, um, to the finish. And so it would help the runners in terms of um, their performance. And it would be an unfair advantage for that person to be given the, the world record um, simply based on those conditions. Similarly, um, a downhill run, a run where the start here is, let's say, a uh, hundred meters above sea level, and the finish here is 50 meters above sea level, then it's a downhill run. So the runner has had an unfair advantage over other people trying to beat that record. Does, does that help? An A to B course could similarly be from here, going round and coming in here, where this distance, as the crow flies, straight line, is, let's say, 18 kilometers. It's under the 21 kilometers, 50% of the total distance of the race. Therefore, it's acceptable for a record. And the theory is, that no matter which um, way you planned your course of a 42 kilometer, you were never going to have a substantial tailwind because you're going to be going into the wind or side on to the wind in finding your way from this point to that point. Therefore, it's under 50%, when it's under 50% of the total race distance, then it would be acceptable. So an A to B that is separated by less than 50% of the race distance is acceptable for a record. Does that answer the question? Who's, whose was it? Um, Mr. Valson from India. Mr. Valson. Mr. Valson. CK. Is he is he on here? Yes, he is. Yes, yes. And are you happy with the answer? Can you just unmute and
Yeah. Jabatan, do you have a comment okay. or maybe would like to make a suggestion? Okay. No. Okay, so I'll assume that unless there's another question coming, that that's, that's explained. Everyone happy with that. If we have grassland on the curve of, five, um, of 500 meters, which cannot be avoided, uh, then how do we measure? Okay, actually, it's an excellent question. Thank you very much for that. Um, many races finish on grass or open area. And some races even start on an open area. And so what I would normally do is measure that using the bike, measure a route using the bike to the gate post of that open area or some other landmark on that open area and give that distance that needs to be used and laid out for the start of the, the race. This is really more national races or club races, more than um, international or label races, but we can get around that. Um, so we're starting or finishing, you get to a gate and you say, uh, the finish is 120 meters from this point. Um, and it can be then be laid out in the days before the race, using a surveyor's wheel or something of that nature, which will um, which will uh, allow you to place that place that race finish or start um, in that fashion in that fashion in there the way you want. You can put the finish gantry where you want as long as it's a hundred. 20 meters or 60 meters or whatever the distance is um, from the gate post. Again, does that help you uh, with that? Who did that come from? That came from bank, uh, from? From India, Mr. Krishnan. Mr. Krishnan, does that, does that help you? Mr. Krishnan? The other thing is if you have to use a path or a grass or a bit of dirt road or something like that, you're in the middle of a run, you can't avoid it, there aren't enough roads, then simply cycle through uh, on the shortest possible line, measure that distance as a, as a set distance, and allow them again to uh, mark that course out in the days before using a severe wheel or a tape measure, depending on how far it is. And it must therefore be a minimum of the distance that you measured uh, during your course measurement. Can AIMS organize an event bypassing the local national federation? I think we'd covered that fairly well uh, yesterday, but the answer is AIMS do not organize events. AIMS do not organize events. AIMS give membership to events. Therefore, the event has to be a member. To claim AIMS recognition, the event needs to be a member of AIMS. To be a member of AIMS, you have to have the course measured and you have to apply for membership. And membership form application has on it a section that requires to be signed by the member federation. Therefore, any event that claims AIMS membership must have made contact with the member federation. I, I, I hoping, Thank you, sir. I, I'm hoping that clarifies it. Thank you, sir. Yes. Thank you. Um, I know we've, if you want to join the conversation with uh, Satish afterwards, 
Um, I know that he has some real concerns in India over this, and we will, we will, we can discuss that um, between the three of us offline. I don't think we want to get into too much detail on here uh, on that. Okay. Focus that. Uh, okay. Okay. Thank you. I'm happy with that. Uh, this part is measured with steel calibrated tape. Yes. Yes, if you're using a tape anywhere, use a steel one. Look, if you're marking, if you're measuring just to a nail, then yes, you can use a, a fiberglass tape, something of that nature. If you're if you're locating something, you can do that. You can even, uh, if it's uh, you're going to put up a sign and you're you're saying to someone, um, I want the sign at 7.1 kilometers, you know, but you, the sign is telling you that there's toilets down the road or something like that, then you can estimate it from a lamppost, uh, you know, three meters before lamppost number 25 on this road. But anything you are tying in, the nail to mark the start, the nail to mark the finish, uh, a turn point, should be measured in with the steel tape or at least if you're going only up to say 10 meters then you could use a fiberglass tape to find that nail point because you're only using it for location but um and don't forget with a turn point wherever possible put a radius in there and that radius Let's say it's a three meter radius, which means that uh, your cones for that would be on 2.7 meters. You would put traffic cones for that turn because you're going to allow 300 millimeters from the cone to the three meter running line radius. Is that okay? There are, uh, Mary, there are still some more questions. So would you like to, to, to have break first or we continue with the question? I think let's continue with the question as long as you guys don't mind me having a, a drink every now and again. Okay, so this is- My drink is coffee at present. You're at night, you can have a beer or a wine if you want. Carry on with the questions and let's then Okay, so this is from Mr. Rajesh Bajajarya of Nepal. How to post calibration if they didn't get 300 straight flat road? <laughs> 300 meters flat road. Okay, excellent. And I guess in Nepal, um, you won't find a flat road very, very easily either. Um, give me an example of what you do have, please. You know, you don't have a 300 straight or you don't have a flat road. Whoever asked the question? Who, who asked the question, please? Rakesh. Rakesh. Yeah, yeah, from New I'm, I'm looking for you here. I can't see you yet. Yeah, I'm here. Okay, let me just try and find, because I've only got a strip here. Okay, um, what do you have? What can you offer me? 200 meters straight, or do you have a 300 meters straight, but it's not flat? What is the, where are that, you that, feeling? That's a three, 300, meter, 300 meters straight line. I, yeah. I did that in a, in a, out of Kathmandu. In a, I'm also one of, uh, I did uh, 2001 in, uh, in Jakarta in a uh, road measurement course. So okay. I have been into road measurement uh, out of Kathmandu. This is called the Pokhara. So I did not get in near the starting place, uh, 300 meter flat road. That's not 300 meter. They have not any. 100 meters also straight and flat roads. And I have been near about three kilometers far from the start line to find a, a straight road, not a flat. That one is also not too much the flat, not uh, 
a straight road I uh, get and I, I measured the post uh, calibration and after the I start the measure after I pack from the three kilometer. Okay. So the ideal thing is to have that 300 millimeter straight and flat on the route that you're measuring so that the road surface is uh, the same as you're measuring. But yes, you're, you're correct. There are many times uh, and many countries where you can't get, um, you can't get flat, but you can get 300 uh, that undulates or is hilly. And the, the truth of the matter is that often the route that you're going with, well, if you can't find 300 flat, you're not going to be measuring a flat course. Therefore, um, you, your calibration can be on a hillier course. And that will be representative of the course that you're going to measure. So in some ways, it is even more accurate to do it on that. Does that make sense to you? That uh, if you're going to measure a hilly course, then you might as well calibrate on a hilly course if you don't have the opportunity of a 300 meter flat. Does that make sense? You get it? Okay. Yeah. So I'm saying as long as you can get as close as you can to flat, uh, to straight, then yeah. go and measure, go and measure um, on the hilly course, but mark out your calibration on that hilly course, 300 meters straight. Now, if it was a local race, a local club race, and I couldn't find the 300 meters, but I could find 250, I would use that. I would use that, but it wouldn't necessarily be, well, it's not going to be a record course because it's going to be a hilly course. So chances are you're not going to get any records on it. Um, the other thing is that you can, if you've got a, a yellow line or something like that on the road and you're really stuck, then measure using your tape on the yellow line. That means not trying to do 50 meters at a time, doing 10 meters at a time or five meters, depending on the curve of that yellow line and measure around that. But again, that's going to have to be shown up in your report and that, that course and that calibration won't satisfy the full requirements of a world uh, athletics course, but it will give you the accuracy you require for an event. Okay, thank help? you. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. And we, unfortunately, unfortunately, things are not always ideal in every city and every country, and we have to use what we can. Um, but we mustn't make excuses, if you understand. There's a difference between having a reason to do it um, that isn't because it's convenient to us, you know? And you may, but you have to watch, and particularly in Nepal, I'm sure you're going to have to watch. Um, you, you, you may go to another place quite far away to do a comparison between the calibration that you you used for that course and a calibration that is that you can use a 300 meter straight flat but obviously in Nepal you'll have to watch what that change of altitude is Mostly, I did uh, different uh, <coughs> different uh, courses, but uh, I get the problem in in that one one course. Yeah. Now look, I mean, 
it is it it is a it is a thing that we come across now and again. I've 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 spent a long time in a place in Nigeria where we just could not find long enough. Um, or and there are other places where the last twenty meters is on a on a bend, but luckily there tends to be some sort of marker, a good curb or a good um, where you can actually work around it or you're carrying straight on into the corner and the road is quiet enough to do it, you know. But it is a, it is a challenge um, and that's where your experience as a, a measurer uh, helps the event organizer. Okay. Okay. Is it is it okay, Mr. Arakas? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. And now the next question from Mr. Paulson. Do the whole course be made with continuous line blue or cut lines? I'm sorry, I, I'm 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 not under the blue line. Uh, do the whole course be made with continuous line blue or cut oh. lines? Yeah. Okay. Um, where we can, we have something called the blue line, which doesn't have to be blue. Um, and it is an indicator of which side of the road um, we have measured on and where we have measured. So if we go to London Marathon as an example, I'll give you two examples. London Marathon um, uses a dotted three stripe line. They use the three stripe line because of course of Adidas being the sponsor. Um, and they will go out the night before and they put down this special paint um, and they show the shortest line from one corner to the other corner. But the reality is those spray guns don't move very far. So, and you can never get the vehicle right in to 300 millimeters off the curb. So the line isn't exactly the measured line. It is only an indication of the fact that you're swapping from the left-hand side to the right-hand side or the right-hand side to the uh, left-hand side. Um, it's giving you an idea of where the shortest line is. At the end of the marathon, and I think the cutoff for London is eight hours, I, I might be wrong, but they have a, a cleaning machine with water and a stiff brush, which they then send round after the back runner and they actually clean that blue line off immediately. Let's go to the other extreme. Um, oh, and by the way, the course measurer is the person with uh, that, putting that line down. And from experience in Beirut, uh, not, not Beirut, sorry, in uh, Jordan, in Amman, um, <laughs> it's taken a number of years, but the uh, in a man, we put down the blue line uh, the night or about a week before, actually, we put down the blue line. And um, unfortunately, it takes about oh, probably five Ks before the people putting down the blue line really understand what is required. Because remember, they are all taught um, and every day mark down straight lines parallel to the curb. And so the blue line suddenly takes corners that aren't there. So you actually want them to practice somewhere before they do the final blue line. But now we get it correct in Jordan in a man. Um, the other extreme is uh, the Sydney uh, Sydney Olympics again, where the person that got the contract for putting down the blue, blue line was a runner, and he came from uh, he came from Brisbane, 
And he said, if I'm putting down this blue line, it's going to be 100% correct. And it's not going to be for six months. It's going to be for six years. I think there is still the blue line down there. You can still see it on the course. And that's now for 2020 years later. And what he did was he went out night after night. He would put out stickers so that people wouldn't park their cars on the section of road that uh, he was doing. And he would manipulate the vehicle left and right. So he would go forwards or back so that he could get the spray paint right into 300 milliliter, millimeters off the curb. That is probably the most correct blue line that has ever been put down. So yes, we do that. However, thank you. Many, many countries won't let you do that or many cities won't let you do that. You can buy through UK from city arrows. Chico. And put those arrows down to show the direction at corners. So that would be another alternative of doing it. Okay, 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 okay. Thank you. And now from Mr. Satis, how does the pressure of the tire and speed of the cycle impacts measurement? Okay, so you pump the tire hard um, prior to it. As you cycle, the friction that allows that tire to go around, the, the air in the tire heats up, therefore, the circumference of the tire increases. Therefore, the number of clicks required over uh, to, to uh, measure out a kilometer reduces. And so when we start with a cold tire, whether it's heating up through the sun or heating up from friction, um, of, of the road, um, when we get to the end, the number of clicks required per kilometer is less than the number required at the beginning. And so the post calibration takes that into account um, on a linear basis. So yeah, you, you're the, that way you're putting out a longer course. So you're actually making it safe, safer. If it's warm when you start and cold when you finish, that's when you've got to be very aware and redo your calibration and add distance in at the end. Hey, Mr. Satis. Yeah, it's okay, fine. Thank you. Thank you so much. And this is last question from Mr. Dwi Priyono, Indonesia. If the course is limited only five years, how about the measurer? Is there a limit? Um, I'm, I'm, give me that one again. The course is valid for five years. Are you saying how often should a measurer be uh, uh, validated or, or yeah. yeah okay well that's a, that's actually an excellent excellent question so many countries and many federations suddenly say yep we want we want uh, uh, measurers and they will uh, they will hold a course and they try to have maybe 20 measurers on that course. And my belief is that's a mistake. Uh, a measurer is only as good as his practical experience um, and how often he does it. So at one stage in South Africa during isolation, I think we had something like 30 measurers for one province. And the problem was they were measuring their own races, their own club races and nothing else. So they would get one measurement in a year and 
therefore they would become stale because the measurement is the measurer often has to make calls just as you've heard these last questions you know what will i do here how, how am i going to handle this and as we've agreed no course is the same so the the measurer should be doing i would say at least six um measurements in a year at least six i will do maybe 20 30 in a year but you you need to be doing this regularly and you're quite correct you're bringing up some very good points that uh, you know there should be some sort of assessment now i've done i've been involved with four olympic measurement five olympic measurements um and i paid my way to all of those to gain the experience of what other people were doing and so on um and I think that's the important thing that the federations also need to make sure that they appoint their measures um, to do their national championships and to allow other people to come along and benefit from that experience as doing it as a group. Um, and also to have understudies, you know, the newer measures working with the experienced measurements. But remember, a measurer needs to be compensated for, for that work. Um, so race organizers are not going to pay for two measurers when they can pay for one measurer. So, you know, the measurer also then has to say, well, if I want to carry on in this uh, uh, career or, or aspect of the sport, I must also be willing to put in some money and time to be qualified. But the strict answer is there is no ongoing assessment of a measurer other than the submission of his courses to, um, to the certifier for certification, or in the case where his course has a record and it has to be validated. In South Africa, we validate, we pre-validate every national championship course. So there would be someone who lays it out and then an A grade will go along and pre-validate it. So if there is a record run, age group or any other, then it is automatically known that the course is um, correct. And of course, the course measurer will, or the validator will observe the race, uh, either from a, a lead car or from a separate bike, or he may even be the lead bike on the race. Does that answer your question, sir? Is it okay, Padre? Yeah, thank you, Honore. Okay, and uh, there is last question before we break uh, from Mr. Indrajit. Post calibration course. Wait a minute. Post calibration. Uh, yes, post calibration course should be the same. Not necessarily, as long as you're confident of the um, of the quality and the measurement of both calibration courses. Um, so by definition, the calibration course is done, as I say, with a steel tape, but it becomes impractical sometimes uh, to use the same start calibration and end calibration. And we talked about that regarding the Sydney Olympics and the potential problem that if the uh, road surface is different and your tires are different, then uh, you know your tires are different between two measurers. Then there is the possibility of uh, an apparent discrepancy that isn't there. Uh, so yeah, you can use and you can use intermediates. I, I measured a hundred mile race um, from down Florida Keys 
you may know Key Largo, Key uh, Marathon, and Key West. So it was uh, it's 50 miles to Marathon. So in the day one, I measured from Key Largo, a calibration I'd set up there, to the city of Marathon or town of Marathon, halfway down the Florida Keys. And I have a calibration course there. And then day two, I started on that calibration in Marathon and had a calibration course down in, uh, in Key West. So as long as you are confident of those distances, you can use calibration courses for post and yeah, Mr. Andrejir. Thank you. Okay, then Nori. So what about break? I have five, five minutes. Yes, it will be okay. Great. Okay, Great. so we have break five minutes. Yeah, thanks.
How are we doing? Yes, everybody's here. I don't know if you've noticed uh, that I've got a bit closer to you guys today. Do you recognize the, the background? Yeah. Come, come. Oh. I thought I'd try and make you feel a bit more at home. Okay, will we start back, guys? Is that okay? Or do we need another few minutes? It's already five minutes, actually. Yeah. Oh, but, but there is a question again from yep. Mr. Indrajit. Yep. Uh, you said that the difference between two measures of 10K should be less than eight meter. Is yep. it for 10K or any distance? Any, or, any, or any distance. distance you measure? Yeah, any distance that you measure, it's actually 0 0.0008. Um, of a difference. So it's eight meters in uh, eight meters and 10 Ks that you're allowed as a tolerance for that distance. Okay. So if I'm doing a, a let's take a 21, then it would be 16, uh, just over 16 meters difference that I'm allowed. If I'm doing a five kilometer race, and of course, five kilometers is now a world record distance. Then uh, I would uh, I would be allowed a four meter difference between the two measures. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, what will be very useful, guys, is when your question comes up, if you can unmute and just say hello so that you. I, I see who I'm talking to, if you know what I mean. Okay, but great. Let's, um, I'll go back to sharing the screen. We're going to look at refreshment tables. Um, and obviously we, there's no point in just talking about refreshment tables as they were. We need to be looking at refreshment tables as we think they're going to be for COVID. Um, because we can't get away from what's uh, going on. In the background here, you can see a series of, we call them gazebos, blue gazebos. Um, it's actually a branding of a bank. And uh, you can see this was, this was a 10 kilometer a mass event. This is the very end of the people going through the walkers um, and how the table is there and people were handing out uh, handing out water and these tend to be at uh, five kilometer intervals but you can have them more frequent now let's just quickly talk about that so world athletics say refreshment tables should be at five kilometers <coughs> Excuse me. Um, in South Africa, we say as a whole, ASA or Athletics Federation has a set of rules and it says three kilometers. And in the province I live in, in, in Durban, South Africa, it's humid and hot, uh, similar to Hawaii, similar to many of the places in Asia. And we say, not more than 2.5 kilometers between refreshment tables. So the minimum of five is a world standard and caters for places like Scotland where uh, it never gets hot. Um, but there is nothing to stop you having a rule within your, uh, within your federation that uh, insists on it being closer together and more water. Um, a race of 10 kilometers over can provide water, energy drinks. That's, uh, that's 
should be a sport type energy drink, not a clubbing type energy drink, in my opinion. Uh, and I think medical uh, opinion would support that. You know, very high caffeine, uh, taurine type drinks are not particularly good for runners, but consider, consider it. Food, obviously, um, particularly in the longer, in the longer events, and uh, then ice and sponges. But uh, we we've seen and had uh, health risks with the uh, sponges in terms of red eye passing on passing on viruses and so on so i suspect the sponges are going to fall away to a large degree um, with with where we are nowadays one of the things that we use for water is sashes uh, plastic sashes um, where you literally have to bite the corner off and drink the water or bite through the uh, bite through the plastic. Uh, now, the problem with that is it's uh, not particularly environmentally good. Um, but what it does allow you to do is to use the water over your head very easily. Um, one of the things I would suggest we start looking at is the recyclable uh, sort of shampoo type container. Maybe I can, uh, maybe I will get one for tomorrow and, and show you where actually it's very easy to have them filled with water or energy drink. They're very easy to drink out of because they're soft, but they're also good for putting over uh, your, your head. Uh, we have a rule in, in uh, my province, KwaZulu-Natal, that says that the water container must be wider at the base than it is at the mouth. So in other words, a normal paper cup doesn't work. Um, so we have containers that have a, a wide base, a narrow top, which allows you to drink. And that, of course, the reason for that is that um, hydration in hot and humid weather is very critical, you know, and we saw that in uh, World Championships in Qatar, and we saw it again in the Olympic marathon uh, in Tokyo or in Osaka, um, where people were dehydrating uh, badly. And it was interesting that uh, Eliud uh, Kipchoge uh, ran a 2.08. Um, and even when he was running 14.30 for the five kilometers, if you allow for the heat and humidity, he was not running faster than his 2.01 pace ever. So he was always in control, but he was stretching everyone else who was not capable of a 201 pace because his pace uh, at one stage was 206, uh, 205, but he was never faster than his 201 pace, allowing for the effect of the heat and humidity, which was about 3%, I reckon. Okay, uh, considerations for the con uh, for uh, COVID virus. What sort of containers to use? Um, it would be good to have something that people can carry, ditch before the water table, and then uh, pick up new ones, because everyone has to go in and pick up their own water. Uh, as you are all aware, if you use paper cups and so on, and there is a wind, there is a problem, um, it's very easy to knock over a paper cup because the base at the, the bottom is narrower than the mouth at the top. So paper cups are not ideal um, in many ways. We also have to restock them and to restock paper cups is, is problematic. If one 
uh, gets knocked over, a lots get knocked over. Um, you can't sanitize a, a paper cup. So we tend to have gone for bottles, but bottles come in many countries, the smallest you can get is 300. In some countries, particularly Middle East, you can get uh, bottles of water down at 125 mils. In my opinion, 150 to 200 uh, milliliters is the ideal bottle size or container size, because if the uh, tables are, let's say, three kilometers apart, um, then that's, uh, uh, that's the sort of amount of uh, drink that you require for an average running pace. So my calculations tend to work on 600 mils per hour. That's 100 mils per 10 minutes. If you're three kilometers apart and you're running, let's say, a five-hour marathon, which is seven minutes a K, then that's 20 minutes. That's 200 mils. So bottles of 200 mils minimizes the waste um, of water um, and at the same time uh, gives you a container that actually can fit into the runner's hands quite easily. And of course, if the runner takes two, then they're well balanced. And I'm a big believer as a coach in balanced running. Uh, food and separate wrappings, so that again, you go in there and you pick up something. Uh, if you require food and you don't contaminate other people's food. Minimize the contact, self-collect, refill on the carry your own. I have a, a, a bit of a dilemma on the carry your own. If you're going to have a camelback that lasts the whole way, great, fantastic. If you're going to have hand containers, um, great. But if you're going to fill them up, I don't think we should be having queues longer than two to three people. Um, just again, because of the um, social distancing and any refill should be done prior to the normal tables. So that if for some reason you can't refill, uh, then you've still got the option of getting some water from the table. Uh, waste and littering. Uh, the, I'm trying to think which Chinese one it was. It wasn't Kuming. There was one in China in particular, anyway, where they create waste throw, throwaway areas, which are about one and a half meters wide and about three meters long. And your only objective is to throw whatever you're throwing away into that area. That's their request. Be it tops of bottles, be it bottles, be it partially empty bottles. And that to me works very well. These small boxes that we often see at the side of a road to me are, are a waste of time, but, and particularly with sashes because we can't get the people battle to get the sashi into the box. You know, if we're running in, in events where there are lots of runners, we may be in the middle of the road. You're not going to cut across at a diagonal to put something in a box because you're cutting across other runners. The, the risks of injury, the risks of tripping, et cetera, become excessive. So rather let's try and make our waste and throw areas much bigger so that, that people can throw from the middle of the road to the side. Try and have them on both sides of the running area. Then, of course, because it's now been touched and you've had your mouth on the, uh, on the cup or the container, it, to a large degree, it's considered medical waste. And in some countries, that means... Uh, you would certainly have to have people with full PPP, PPE on and cleaning that up, putting it into uh, specialized bags that are going to be incinerated 
or properly cleaned and recycled. Uh, recycling obviously is um, an ideal objective. Um, in fact, there you are there. There is the size of the throw zone in this race. It will come back to me which race it is. Uh, so there they've got their water and they're throwing into that zone. Um, this is no longer going to be allowed. Um, with COVID, now it's going to be a case of uh, going in there and collecting your own water. Uh, so what determines how many refreshment tables and how often and so on? Uh, the weather determines it, as we've discussed. The fitness of the runner. You know, a walker uh, maybe going at... Uh, at 15, uh, 15 minutes a K, 20 minutes a K. Uh, that means they need, uh, if you keep your tables at uh, three kilometer intervals, they would need roughly 600 mils per table. That's three bottles, three 200 millimeter bottles, you know? Uh, so you've got to think of the size and amount of servings. And, <clears throat> The number of runners will determine how many tables you actually require and the length of each water point. And particularly now, we need to space them out. And because we have to restock them, because people are taking their water off the table, self-service, then we're going to have to increase the number of tables so that some are out of action when others are being restocked. Um, consider what's offered on the table and consider the impacts of the uh, drink containers. That's quite a big bottle to be carrying around. How do you deliver the items? You know, that's also going to come into place. In really big events, they use forklift trucks to take the bottles and pallets off the truck uh, because they've got that many bottles they've got to have. Uh, available. Uh, number of tables, manpowers we've talked about, uh, how tables are restocked. It obviously makes sense. You see in here, there is a junction here. It makes sense to place your tables fairly close to junctions so that if there is a problem, you can service from uh, another road into that uh, into that junction so the truck can come to the junction and it can restock that table easily. Uh, okay, personal or mass uh, refreshment and the use of assistance and team members. That's all beginning to change to, as I say, self-service um, throughout because of this uh, virus situation. Something else to consider, the majority of people are actually right-handed. So it makes sense to try and put your tables on the right side of the road. So people are easier to go in there and pick up. It wasn't the case when people were handing drinks out, but now that we're having to go in and get them, uh, the majority should be on the right-hand side, probably. The location of tables for the restocking close to the accessible roads. Uh, accessible for waterways, uh, cycle paths. You know, don't just think in terms of uh, roads, think in terms of any way that you can get to that table. Uh, where are your reserve supplies? Maybe have small emergency reserves within a sector of a route, and then the longer term solution is coming in by truck if it's needed. There's a, an even better photo of how they set up that row zone. And you will see that that, that 
and that and that. The four corners are actually simply boxes. And there's been a bit of plastic branding or mesh branding put around those boxes. And they've created very cheaply, very easily, A, a branding opportunity, and B, um, uh, and B, a nice, wide, easily targeted through zone for waste. Littering and waste management, the choice of the container material, we know plastic is, is not environmentally uh, friendly. We know that long before plastic became an issue, trees and paper became an issue. And now suddenly uh, there are people who are backtracking and saying, no, we must use paper cups. Well, paper cups for me don't, don't particularly work. And certainly in this situation where you've got high risk of wind and so on, paper cups being blown away and then off a bridge into the ocean are not particularly the, the solution we're looking for. I've talked about the larger base than mouth or, or, and sashes. Uh, create something that's got a low center of gravity and stability. Recyclable is important. And consider now, is it medical waste? If it is, then it's got to be kept separate. Um, it's got to be kept separate and it's got to be incinerated afterwards. Uh, under this, at the present, this is on road and this is a very smooth road. So it's easy to pick stuff up or brush stuff up into uh, a bag or some other container to be taken away. But where perhaps it's on grass, put a ground sheet down so that you've got a smooth surface that you can sweep in to the other container to collect. The great thing about this is all your waste, if it's used properly in Asia, I mean, I am, I'm really impressed with uh, generally with the uh, the waste management within Asia. I don't think it's something, I think you're leading the world in many ways uh, with it. That's my experience in, in, in Asia. It's, it's always a pleasure to see how clean it is and how fast you clean up in Asia. So, um, but if, it, if you're having to put this on grass, put a ground sheet down so that it's easy to uh, clean up. If using carry bottles, then waste area before. What I'm meaning by that is if the runners are willing to carry bottles, you're giving them two bottles at the beginning, um, then they come to the next water point, give them the opportunity to throw away their used bottles and pick up two new ones. Okay. Uh, this is what you're seeing here is Qatar, the World Championship. And you can see here, now there's the, there's the shortest running line, that white solid line there. But they've got this out here on the right-hand side. Um, it was a fairly small field. It was probably 100 and something runners. I would have preferred this to be even further forward. Remember, this is pre-COVID as well, um, but it is on the right-hand side. Uh, it is possible to put them on the left-hand side here as well. And that is your running line, but make sure it is off the grass. And this means that even people who don't want water are going to have to run there to get the shortest line. So, uh, in fact, I think we probably all saw the video that did the circulation um, of a runner who appeared to knock down all the other water bottles. Um, and that was put on the shortest line on the right hand side. He put out his hand and some say deliberate, some say accidentally took out so many water bottles and then got the last one um, himself and carried on running. So having it off the running line and making sure that it doesn't 
sit on the running line and force runners to run wide is important. Um, putting it out here means that only the runners that want water will go out. But for a race of 100 people, for me, that was just too far out. I probably have brought it to this dotted line. Notice the sign here beforehand, warning people of it. And if you're going to have water, then energy drink and food and so on, keep it in the same order throughout the race because the runner then knows where he's going. Um, maintain, maintain same order, typically personal team stations um, by, an, by number of team. So in a world event, in an international, major international event where elite athletes are allowed to have their own drinks, uh, keep the order the same. Uh, so, you know, you do it alphabetically or do it by color code or whatever, but keep the order the same. The waste area for pre-drop or self-carry and a waste area for drop of personal at the end. Uh, also the personal stations, the team stations, that needs to be separate. And again, team stations would be before the normal mass stations. So where they have their own special drinks, they're put on tables about 50 meters before the normal drink station. So if they miss that personal drink or for some reason that personal drink has already been taken by someone else by mistake, then they can get their normal water on the normal station. Um, yeah, they're followed by mass water, mass energy drinks, and mass food or other items. Um, optional mass water repeat. Always end up making sure that anyone can get water um, at the prescribed intervals. Both sides, I think we've covered all of these points. This is how they did the personal drinks in, in uh, China. They had a very large number of um, uh, drinks to be handed out because they had a large number of, this is uh, Xiamin in, in China. They had a large number of international runners and elite runners. So the elite runner number is marked on the sleeve. So when I'm coming in, I come in and I get that number. The table number told me which table to go to. So we knew that, let's say, uh, the first nine runners were going to table two, or sorry, let's say five to 10, we're going to table two. So the helpers came with that number and they knew they could get that particular drink. In this case, it was water, but in many of the cases, the runners had their own special drinks and it was easy to see. So the rules applying to that come under rule 55.8.4 to six, securely delivered to the table points. So what actually happens where you have an elite field that are entitled to um, entitled to personal drinks is there is an athletes meeting the day before, normally the day before. Excuse me while I just have something from my throat. And at that meeting, they bring along their bottles, which should be marked specifically with their race number in a fashion that they can see. And it would tell you at what point along the course they want that particular bottle. So it would have say race number five at eight kilometers. And that bottle is then put in a box or a crate or some secure, um, some secure 
uh, carrying uh, uh, bag. And that is sealed by a technical official and signed across by the technical official who will be in charge of that table at eight kilometers. So he does that for all the boxes, for all the bottles required at eight kilometers. That is then taken and put in a refrigerated area and a secure area so that no one can tamper with that bottle because that is that runner's personal drink for that particular point. Obviously, the concern is that the bottle is uh, in some way tampered with and uh, contaminated. And if that runner is tested for doping control at the end of the event and found to be um, positive for some banned substance, then we must be able to assure the doping control tribunal that his drink was safe and was not tampered with by anyone. So that is the purpose of that whole process. So the bottle is then taken on race morning or the containers taken on race morning to the refreshment station and opened by the same official that signed across the seal or activated the seal. So that official is then confident that that box has not been tampered with. You then now go in and self, self collect that bottle. Here before COVID, they were able to hand them out and this is how they did it. It was quite an ingenious system and uh, worked very well. Under rules at world events, uh, there can be handed. I'm not sure what they're doing uh, and each event will be different um, in future. Normally there are two accredited persons uh, allowed in a world team event, such as a marathon or a race walk um, for three runners. So that's what has happened. I'm sure it's going to change. Um, at Tokyo, they had to go in and collect their own. Um, but, you know, things will change and you need to be prepared for either action. The order of the tables is standardized by the race number or the race uh, code, you know, RSA for South Africa. Um, I think it's CHN for China, etc. Small numbers of drinks per table, because you don't want people coming in and um, knocking them over, particularly at personal drinks. Uh, no one can run with the runner. It must be off the, uh, the run line and out of the way, but not too far out of the way that the runner is disadvantaged by having to go to get his bottle. Uh, this is barriered off or should be barriered off for security so that you know anyone that is in there is accredited to touch those bottles and no intermediate refreshments. You can't have an official in these sort of events, you know, just someone at the side of the road handing a bottle across. That uh, is not allowed. They can only be collected from official stations. Maybe. If there are any questions on this section, we should deal with them now. Particularly, I'm talking about elite race bottles. Is this all clear to everyone or does anyone have a question? Just stick a hand up if you've got a question, please. There's a little diagram that you click on for hand up. Everyone seems happy, so we will move on. Okay, venue considerations. And again, we're having to bring in the uh, COVID. Cons 
considerations. Um, this is a start finish. I'm not sure where this event is. I have a feeling it's China, but you can see the the line up here and the spacing here. These are the timing mats, which we will come to and so on. And everyone is spaced out and they're going to start them off on a mat to mat scenario. Um, now we used, as I said yesterday, we used a similar lineup situation for the start of our national championships. And uh, what we then did was, it didn't go as far back as that, it probably went back to about there. And when we announced, take your marks, we extended that time uh, to probably about six seconds, five, five six seconds, because that's quite long. And the people came forward and then we shot the gun almost as the back guys were getting to this point and we shot the gun. Um, that is still, I think, going to be the preferred way going forward. And obviously these guys all have to wear masks until the final two, three minutes. And we simply put people going up through the middle there with baskets um, and the, the runners took the masks off and put them in the baskets. And that was then considered a uh, waste material. So COVID considerations, uh, social distancing and masks at arrival, um, screening and temperature checks for acceptance before they even get into the safety perimeter. Uh, race day data collection and storage. So the temperature, uh, that all needs to be then stored with the uh, entry data. Um, <clears throat> uh, the holding areas need to be designed with social distancing in mind um, and seating of people within the holding areas so that you've got people of similar ability within these holding areas. Uh, consider also the warm up here. You can see they've put flags in for that. Um, we might as well address this. This may be okay for a, a recreational runner, and you may have views on that. But of course, it needs to be on here and here for um, the contenders and elite runners. Uh, then you work out the floor to the start, keeping discipline between the holding areas, start options, we can talk about, we've given one example on there. And then what does that do to your race timing, your results and the quality of competition? So these are things that we need to be considering. I, I've picked this photo. I mean, this is obviously in the middle of a, a run and I think it's somewhere in Europe. I picked this one because to me, this would be an almost ideal start area. This is clearly some sort of underpass over a dual carriageway road. And presumably these roads feed in from this side to this side. Now imagine the start is here and you've got your, your runners then feeding in from the other end, which obviously will come down. Um, equally on the other side, and you're feeding in people in a controlled fashion. And then they come to their start line and you can have your social distancing and you can start them off. And you could start the left side first and your uh, right side, you know, a minute or two later. And the further down here you, uh, you go, um, they can then blend together left to right or right to left onto the one as the runners spread out on either side. So this, this has great potential to me of uh, a starting. What you're looking for is a venue with controlled access. And this would have controlled access on the other side where the runners are coming in. They could be screened 
they could be checked, they could be put into holding groups, the groups could move forward. So mall car parks are, are good stadiums. You know, the center of a stadium is roughly the size of a soccer pitch, um, which let me just quickly reconfirm that figure, but I would think you can get about um, uh, 500 people in there fully socially uh, distance. It's going to be what 120 by 55. Yeah, you could probably get in about 800, 900 people socially distanced into that. If you're putting them in holding pens, that would probably come down to 600 uh, people on the center of the stadium, just on the grass area. You know, so think of stadiums, flyovers. Why flyovers? Again, because just as this goes down and under, going up and over will tend to have barriers on this side, barriers on that side. People can't come in from the side. It's a controlled, secure entrance. You know that anyone that has gone in there has been screened. When you're... Um, dealing with a perimeter area um, and you're screening people for temperature or um, or they're having to submit a form, self-screening form or show a QR code or whatever, put something on their number, mark their number, mark them, give them a wristband so that they you can see easily that they have been screened and their uh, legitimate entrance in the in the area that you're dealing with once uh, the runner is in that screened area then it's only following all other procedures online covid screening um there are things like health docs i'm sure you've got some in each of your countries that work where you author auto authorize um, the database in other words you're completing the screening form, which says, I'm fit, I'm fine today, I don't have a fever, I don't have a cough, etc. When you send that information through, ideally, it should link up to the database of the entrance. When you come to the perimeter, either your race number has been authorized or a QR code authorizes you that you have already completed that screening form. So you want to minimize the manual form. The manual form is a health risk by itself because it's contaminated. So, and it's got to then be uh, collected in, put in a box with all the other forms and what you're doing is creating a, a risk. However, um, we have to acknowledge that not everyone has smartphones or smart watches or something like that that could have an SMS sent to it that would confirm things. So not everyone has the technology. Uh, higher risks at manual tables. That's the other thing, no matter how many times you write to people or message people, there will be people who do not follow those instructions. And those instructions are new for COVID. So you've got to have a manual backup. And as soon as you go to a manual table, as soon as two people are there, you've created a, a potential risk uh, item. So just try and minimize the use of those, even if you're doing queuing. And as I say, again, uh, my experience in Asia is that you guys are incredibly well disciplined um, and much more reasonable to work with. Um, so, yeah, this is a screening, a screening scenario. Utilize drop and go. Um, um, situation where you're telling people to go to a particular um, area to, um, if they're coming from one area to the race, they must use 
this particular expressway. Uh, if you're coming from this area, please use that uh, road or expressway and so on and so, uh, uh, so on, so that people are told how to get to the start of the race, where to park and which entrances to go to on the perimeter. Okay, uh, utilize drop and go, utilize park and ride, uh, utilize public transport at the prescribed percentages, 50%. Um, remember that in many places, I've said India, small scooters. I mean, you know, in India, often at races, there is an area for small scooters or motorcycle parks. You would never see that in South Africa. Uh, in London Marathon, they use trains and underground to free to the competitors to get them to the start. So every situation is different, but try to help your participants understand how you have organized your race. Send them messages. Send them an SMS the night before with the five most important things for them to remember. That may be bring or make sure you've done your online screening. Um, don't bring a tog bag and you are in uh, batch 10. Please make sure you go to entrance B or something like that. But Give them clear instructions, the last five most important things the night before. As race organizers, as federations, we organize things and we forget too often to actually tell people how we've organized them, what we're expecting. And therefore we get upset when so many people appear to come from the wrong direction to the start. We need to spend much more time on communicating to our users. Uh, provide greater information and access. Remember, in any event, if the start is well controlled and goes off very well, um, the runners and others tend to overlook many of the other problems. The start is our key. Um, some of the regulations are going to increase crime, not again in, in, in certain countries. So we are no longer allowed to have tog bags in some of the countries, you know, bags with the kit in it. That means that people are leaving their kit and their valuables in their cars. Uh, those people who would do crime become aware of that. Um, the use of QR codes and virtual races and so on mean runners are running with phones. Uh, people become aware of that and start mugging people. So just give some thought to how do we create safe COVID compliant areas for personal belongings or even just for a car key for those that don't run with them. I used to always run with my car key um, tied into my laces. Um, and I think that's the sort of thing we're going to have to bring back again. So there's someone doing a, a screening. That temperature needs to be written onto a form or in some way associated with his race number. And that data normally needs to be kept for uh, six uh, six months, according to our regulations. Uh, the screening forms, manual or digital temperature check. Now you can buy these thermal cameras at a very reasonable price, particularly in Asia. Um, that's where we are having to get ours from. There should be a hand sanitizer just inside the perimeter or just outside, depending how you're doing it. There should be spare masks. The runner must have a mask to enter. Uh, try and use technology wherever possible, but you have to minimize the need for phones on the run and uh, cater for those without 
technology. Uh, here is an example of a race that was held in January, January? No, uh, April this year. It's quite small. You won't find the, the writing easy, I'm sure, at this level. But the blue is the cars and people coming. We have no, tra uh, we have no public transport effectively in South Africa. So it's minibus taxis or your own car. This is a mall and the only entrances are there. Uh, there is a car parking entrance there. There is an underground there. So we, we pushed people to try and do drop and go. It's an A to B race. So we took them up here. There was a turning circle here. People could drop and then would go uh, to head towards the finish. Uh, the running route is the red route, by the way. So we didn't really encourage people to go up there, but we accepted that that was okay prior to the, uh, to the event. We were stuck on 500 people with, uh, uh, as, as, a, as a batch, and we were able to convince authorities to let us have uh, just over a thousand runners. We had three batches. Uh, an interesting thing on this, I'll come back to. So we had them going into car park here. This is on a lower level. This green block was an elevator. Uh, what would you, escalator, moving, moving steps. Um, and that was the only access to that particular level in the mall that was open. So everyone had to come up through here and we had a screening on this section here. And once the people had been uh, screened, they were put into uh, holding areas created in around here. We had an isolation area here for anyone that um, failed the screening. And that was obviously kept very, uh, very clear and distant from anything else. There was lots of area to warm up. Of course, at five o'clock and four o'clock in the morning, none of the shops were open, so we didn't have any conflicts with this. Um, our first group started here and went out and went this way. Our first group was the slowest group. And uh, we had, I think, 15 minutes between the groups which meant that they spread out on this uh, road here. And the road was uh, probably 12 meters wide, I, I seem to remember, something like that. Uh, it was two lanes in each direction. And so they spread out very quickly and were not a problem. We then started the second group. It was a 25 kilometer race. Um, and we'd been asked to get through uh, a town five kilometers up the road. The town stretches between five kilometers and eight kilometers through the road. We'd been asked to get through that as fast as possible because it was a Sunday and uh, you start getting church goers in South Africa on the Sunday. And that particular area, the shops also opened so we wanted to avoid that. So we put the fastest runners at the back and we started them. Now that means that the fastest runners were actually going to pass every single person in the race, but the road was wide. The runners spread out so fast that at no point would you have more then I, and I stand corrected, but it was something like 30 runners per minute at any point along the route. But impressively, it was the fastest runners who finished first at the finish 25 kilometers away. So the timing had been analyzed, the seeding had been done so that the winners were back first across the, uh, the line. But I think this is a nice example of 
how things can be coordinated to get your timing right, to keep your fuel uh, fairly concentrated um, and yet still have the race on. Um, the number of gates that you require to do the screening is obviously related directly to how long it takes you to screen one single person. In April, that was a minimum of a minute that we would allow for each person. Therefore, we took the total number of people multiplied by one minute, um, divided into the number of gates that we wanted in order to handle them within an hour with a safety factor. Um, you have to have that safety factor to make allowances for people who just don't do as you ask. Um, and you have to also have to have an allowance that isolation for people who fail the screen. Reality is people who are entering a race and particularly a high prestige race are not going to necessarily honestly um, fill in the screening form. They're going to say they're fine when perhaps they're not because they're anxious to run the race. We have no control over that as yet. Uh, it's sure no build up at the entrance because sometimes what your screening uh, processes are actually become the, a bigger viral problem. Okay, so try and schedule your arrival by waves. Um, here is an example of a contender. Remember we were talking yesterday of how do we identify who contenders are? So in this particular event, and this, by the way, was done long before COVID. In this particular event, we were saying anyone who is a man doing a 42, it's a particularly hilly, tough course. Um, we know that if you uh, do a 255 marathon, um, you definitely will not make it onto the podium. Therefore, we're safe saying anyone that can do faster than 255 uh, will be considered a contender and a woman 348. There's the half marathon times and there's the 10 kilometer times. And as you can see, there's 60 plus and so on. So we're taking all of those people and we're putting them into the contender field, which we started um, ahead of the mass field. Now, please remember, as I say, this is a particularly tough course. It's also run at altitude of 1,700 meters and it's hilly. Um, so, and it's a two lap course. So these figures don't represent anything that you would use in a elite or a mass field. This field, um, the objective is predominantly to run a 42 in under five hours. So this is not uh, representative of normal um, times, but it gives you the idea of what we're trying to do. And generally speaking, these ones in COVID times, Open Junior and the 40 to 49s would be started together because those are the real people who can win the Open. It is unlikely that a 50-year-old will beat an Open, uh, an open uh, category runner. Um, down here is a, another example of how we can run races. So we create four holding areas. Initially, the red again is the, is the route, the blue is the contenders, and the green is the access uh, point. So initially we use this bad gate. This is a, a double soccer pitch club, just a running club and soccer club area. And uh, initially we use the back gate for screening. We have the isolation area there. And when you come in, you get put into these holding areas, which are worked out on 
social distancing, but the contenders are allowed to go. And this is a road, so we've created the, the gate here for the contenders, and they go straight to the road. And this fencing is up already, so no one can come in any other way uh, than through the screening process. Uh, when the race goes off, they start here, they go down, they do, it's a 10 kilometer, and the finish of the race is coming in on this side. So the entrance is now converted into the finish area. They come through to the finish. This yellow line is isolating them off. Um, they then come through here and go out a slightly different way. There's a stairs here out there into the open. And so you can see how this is COVID compliant. And when contenders have gone, the A group moves into the contenders and the B group moves into A. Um, as B group moves into A, D moves into B. So you go off again um, and then C comes into A and so on. So you can see it's easy to process people um, through this and use uh, wave starts. Now, we could in this one, as they exit out of A, allow them to just carry on running straight through. We have our mats here so that we can time people um, and give them a net time. It's only the contenders that would be given a proper gun start time. Hoping this makes some sense. Please, again, if you've got questions, um, start putting them into the chat group because we're coming to the end of our time. Uh, use one or more contenders group to facilitate competitive racing. As I say here, nowadays, what we would do is we would do the 21, uh, possibly if it's the same route or extended route for two lap group, we would use the 21 and 42 together. Then we would do the, when we would use men together, and we'd use women as a separate contenders group, and then we would use the 50 uh, plus uh, as a mixed group, as a third contender uh, section. Okay. Um, Men, women, age group, I've just covered that. Numbers depend on the number and depth of awards. We talked about that yesterday. And it requires info at time of entry. Another very important point in race organization. Do not put out your race flyer or open entries until you have completed your organization of the race logistics, because it is what you ask at the time of entry that actually determines what's on that entry form. And it determines how the results are handled. So you sort of work backwards. The last piece of, the last thing that should go out in race planning is in fact the entry form. Does that make sense to everyone? because the entry form should tell people how you have organized the event. Okay. So uh, gun to line is for the contenders and the rest get net timing. I think uh, let's, let's stop there um, and take questions. Or maybe let's do this. Let's do this. Uh, uh, start configuration uh, slide, and then we'll take questions. Uh, please, let's start getting some questions or comments. You know, again, are we going too slow? Are we spending too much time on areas that you would rather move on from? Uh, this is a very uh, interesting, you can see how far back down the road this, uh, this goes. And in fact, this was taken from the top of scaffolding at the start. And you can see here, there's the mesh across, and this is the mass of runners uh, pre-COVID. 
and the contenders would be brought in here. And you can see we make use of the referees and officials here to make sure that the, it's only the contenders that get in. This one is 2006 Beirut Marathon, which was an exceptionally interesting race. Beirut race was started by a lady called Mayel Khalil. Um, and the first one was 2003, not long after civil war in Lebanon. And it was done as a national, as a way of bringing national building and unity together. By 2006, it had grown quite considerably. You're seeing the mass people coming through here, and you can see it's on a dual carriageway, and there is the Stark Gantry. And the Stark Gantry and this dual carriageway are above a car park. And unfortunately, in that time, there was quite a bit of political unrest, has been in Beirut for quite some time. Um, and it was scheduled for uh, the Sunday. And on the Wednesday, uh, during the day, the race director, Mark Dickinson and myself, um, went up in a helicopter to overview the loop. And during the time we were in the helicopter, there was an assassination of one of the politicians um, with a car bomb. Uh, it was the the Minister of Industry, a very likable person who, uh, as I say, was assassinated. So, of course, we had the, the problem of do we carry on with the marathon or not? And the, uh, the marathon was uh, postponed a week. We decided to postpone it one week. But as I say, the start was on, on this freeway above a car park. Now you're in a situation where terrorism is, is there, and it's the situation where you have to start making ad, uh, adaptations. Um, we delayed it a week, and our security was actually local militia. And so we, we were very lucky that we had such a secure scenario where um, we could control the people coming in onto the dual carriageway because it was elevated and the roof of the car park. We were unlucky in as much as it's a car park. Therefore, we had to have uh, measures in place in case there was another terrorist att attack or anything like that. So we developed a system and it was based on a 1920 cinema disaster in, uh, in Scotland, a place called Paisley, where the cinema went on fire, but the fire exits had all been um, locked. And there was a huge death problem because people trampled on each other because the doors were, were not unlocked on time. Subsequent to that, all theatres in UK used to use a system of playing music. And a particular music meant there was a problem and it alerted staff to go to, um, to, go to the exit doors and open the exit doors before the announcement was made to stop the movie and allow people out. I was the technical consultant for this event and I brought that same system into play. So what happened was uh, I was up at the start, the race director was at the start. Uh, we would take any decision along with the head of the militia as to whether or not there was a terrorist problem. And if there was, we would play Eye of the Tiger, um, and which of course is a great, um, uh, a, a great motivational tune for runners and that would signal to the people on the gates on the fences to open the fences and immediately the fences were opened we shot the gun because the highest danger point from a terrorism point of view 
is the start. That is where everyone is gathered. So if they wanted to do something meaningful, it would be at the start. Therefore, we start the race and um, uh, get ourselves out of that situation as fast as possible. So I just thought that might be quite uh, interesting to you. Um, you've got to think about terrorism as well as, uh, uh, and we've seen that with Boston, obviously, and I think previously there may have been a problem in one of the races in Asia as well. Uh, secure loading from the back. Consider these sort of uh, situations, even protests, even ill-discipline. And in Soweto, I, I, I'm embarrassed to have to tell you that uh, in a 10K race, on one occasion, they managed to bowl over a three-meter high uh, standard, or two-meter high, sorry, uh, standard wire fence um, in their rush to get to the start of the event. Uh, our discipline in South Africa um, is, is, is not great amongst the, uh, the runners at the start of a race, but that is something that we've had to address and gradually it's working. Uh, contender systems, as I say again, uh, obviously uh, this is how we, how we do it. Okay, let's stop here for the, um, for the day. Um, but let's see if we've got any uh, questions. I'm going to stop the share and comments, please. You're welcome to take your, to unmute and give me some feedback, please. Ria Stuti? Yes. Yes, okay, Anything? everyone, please. Please give comments, question, because nothing in the chat box. Nothing. Either I'm doing a good job or everyone has fallen asleep. Maybe tomorrow will be a lot of questions. Uh, uh, please use the... It's not like uh, that. Yes. So we are enjoying it. Yes. Are you? That, that yep. is the most important thing. Harry yeah, so that is the most important thing. That's why. That's why. On the affirmative side, not on the negative side. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, to do, you know, a lot of about measurement. Thank you, sir. Uh, can I come in? I'm going to Please. Sorry, in? just one thing, Stanley, just one thing, please. Um, Satish and the gentleman, I think, from Nepal. Bangladesh, Bangladesh, Abhana Mustafa Kamal. Yes, yeah, please, please stay on uh, at the end, okay? So okay, sir. it will be Ria, Stat uh, Ria Stuti uh, and the two of you and myself that's uh, last to leave, please. Okay. There is a question. Yes. There is a question yes. from Ms. So May of Singapore. Uh, may I know how to order the counter? Um, yes, I, I will get you a contact. Uh, there's, there's one made in, in America um, by Tom Regal, and there is one made in UK. Um, I will try and put both of those together for you for tomorrow. And I also saw the request on the uh, about the clock for the motorbike, and I will try and get that tomorrow. And anything else that you request um, over, well, not overnight, try and do it today. Um, look, it's a, it's a bit of a rush in the morning um, for me. So try and do it today, um, and I'll try and make all of that available for you before the end of tomorrow. Uh, Stanley, yeah. you had a yeah. you had a question. yeah yeah I'm coming. In. See, Mr. Williamson, can I go out? Just to call me Nori. Just call me Nori. Mr. Nori, yeah. 
see while finalizing the route how far we can consider these flyovers for the marathon route or any road race and uh, what up to what degree we can consider for athletes to finish in a better way while finalizing the route can i know i'm i'm not i'm not getting you sorry in in see, what when you when you are going for a marathon course yes how far we can choose the flyovers or uh, bridges where athlete has to get in and to what extent the degree of the flyover can be well you you you're using these flyovers or bridges as venues um and so it depends on the size and the number of people that you've got on it am i answering the correct question for you no no so what can i can, before, I, come in? <laughs> can i get can i can i hey, he wants he wants to know consider can i consider flyover as a part yes. of the course yes so so yes. why why if, you can if it, if it is yes if it is yes how far the degree of difficulty can be from the course It means what the, what can be the steep the steepness of the oh of the i see i see yeah. what you mean oh, yeah yeah sorry okay so i mean if you're using a flyover and you're going to come down um then obviously it's not that difficult to run down the hill so i would be putting my start line somewhere uh around the crest probably of the flyover providing providing that doesn't make the course assisted by putting the the height of the flyover um above the finish point is is that uh see the flyovers are of many types some are some are very steep and some are little steep so sure. how far that degree can be the steepness can be you how can, far it can be. i i mean you don't want to have a 6 degree uh 6% incline decline at the start of the race so you can move your start line down the 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 road I I would think that you're looking at a 2% um a 2% incline max uh, for a start because people tend to be you know jostling a bit at the start so you don't want to create a dangerous situation no, not at the start I'm talking about the on course on the road if you are running a marathon on the road somewhere in the middle of the road. There is oh, okay. There is there is no limit on on how steep a road can be up or down. That is going to be by your uh, your own decision making on safety. But I mean, there is a we have a, a marathon course from Sunny Pass, which is the highest pass in Southern Africa. and uh, there are places on that that are hairpin bends it, it's very steep some would say it's not even runnable but the you know so it's up to yourself on that but it has an impact on performance if you're looking for performance then don't go much more than uh 3% 4% inclines for any distance short inclines can be 6% and it won't have too much influence i think in tokyo in osaka i seem to remember that their flyovers because they used about four flyovers and i seem to remember that there were points on that flyover that were about 4% incline according to google earth according to google earth thank you, you know, it's thank not you, always sir. accurate it's not always accurate but don't thank be scared you, of, don't be scared of bridges you know yeah. don't be scared of flyovers um lagos marathon which is a a, a world label event bronze silver um it has 16 kilometer of bridge on it And the one thing you do know no one's cut that course because they would have to swim 
to, to cut the course. So it has some advantages. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, may I leave today, sir? Uh, sorry, I am a little bit busy with my uh, job place. May we uh, talk up later on? Okay. Carry on. Uh, sir, I am Abu Hanna from Bangladesh. May I leave today, sir? Leave? Yes, yeah, sir. Uh, I, I yeah. am a little bit uh, busy oh, with, see, you're, in you're, your oh, sorry, job place. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, look, I wanted to chat to you about the um, the, the situation. We can, your... oh, we can talk later on. That's fine. That's fine. Okay, I'm, thank you, I'm, sir. I'm available today to uh, five o'clock my time, which yeah, will be yeah. 10 o'clock your time. We can talk um, in your uh, personal WhatsApp. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. You you okay. pick up okay. my WhatsApp from the group. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay, I don't think we have um, more question or comments. So maybe we will. I'm sure that they will save it for tomorrow. <laughs> so tomorrow there will be more yeah. questions than today. Okay, so then. We've got We've got a fair number of slides to get through tomorrow, so I think I'm going to have to pick up the pace. We'll see. Okay. Good. Okay, so thanks a lot to Nori for the informative lecturing today. And thanks to everyone for having attended uh, this, this webinar fully until the end. So have a nice evening and see you tomorrow at the same time. And the Zoom ID remains the same. Yes. And so I might change. My Thank you very much. You should. Please, Nori. Bye. Wait, wait, wait. Yes, Nori, please. No, no. I, I'm saying I might change my place. Today I was Hong Kong. Let me see what background I can find for you tomorrow. Okay. What about Jakarta? Jakarta, I don't <laughs> think I've. You see, you haven't invited me there yet. So oh, this will be the best. There, I will. I will use one yeah. <laughs> okay uh satish please remember to stay on if you're still there you're small this background okay thank you everyone okay bye bye thank you bye bye thank you thank you thank you Lori. <laughs> thank you great session hello the gentleman from maldives <laughs> The gentleman from Maldives, are you with us? Yeah, yes, yeah. I'm with you. Okay, fine. Can we uh, Thank uh, you, chat as well with Satish? You can you can stay for a while. Satish, uh, I can Mr. see Mutaki? you. Yes, I can't yes. see the gentleman from Maldives. Is he no, still no, it was, it was from Bangladesh. He requested your permission to leave. Yeah, yeah. But there was someone from Maldives as well okay. last time. I talked to him offline. Can you see me now? It's me. I can see. I can see Satish. I can see. This Ahmed. is Maldives. Ahmed yes. Mutakim. Maldives. Yeah. Hello, Maldives. Hello. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Um, how many? How many? We've still got twenty or so online. Let's just wait till the the others leave. <laughs>